Hey guys, welcome back to the Unifoil Live Q&A. Uh, got some very special guests on this episode, episode number three. I'm um, joined here today with uh, Clifford Coetzer, our designer, James Robinson, and a very special guest, Tom Earl, all the way from Newquay, England. Uh, so really excited to have Tom on the show today. Um, and uh, yeah, today's I'm, I'm excited about the conversation that we're going to have. It's uh, mainly revolving around stiffness versus flex, which is probably one of the most hotly debated topics in foiling at the moment. Um, uh, and so flex, when I'm talking about flex, I mean uh, efficiency, having a more thinner, efficient mast or, or, or wing, which results in uh, something a little bit more uh, flexy. Uh, so yeah, Tom, you want to introduce yourself to the audience and um, talk a little bit about you know, where you're at and, and what the waves are like over there. Okay. Yeah. Hi guys. Um, so I'm from a little seaside town called Newquay in Cornwall in England. Um, and surfed pretty much my whole life. And then when the foiling come along, it looked so interesting. And I was just had to make the, the leap of faith into get in the gear and thankfully i haven't regretted it um and i'm still pretty addicted probably getting more addicted by the day as well i was a little bit worried it was going to be like a, a faddy thing um and then it's turned out as we all know it's um not really a fad at all it's just as kind of addictive as surfing it has like the same depth um of interest and and it kind of suits um, where I live, like why a lot of people have got into foiling um, for that reason, to kind of be happy with their home break, keeps them in the water most days and gives you that feeling like you're surfing really good waves permanently and keeps the, the stoke really high. Um, so we have a lot of swell um, and we've got a continental shelf, which is really far off our coast. So that kills a lot of the swell energy. So even we know we get a lot of swell, it does tend to be that weaker, kind of um, mushier style of wave. Um, and so the foil really lends itself well um, to our waves. Um, we get really good surfing conditions here, um, but I definitely found myself turning into one of those um, miserable short borders where you always kind of, it never gives you quite enough. Um, it just dangles the carrot all the time. So since I've got into foiling, you've, I'm a, definitely a happier person because um, it just gives you that stoke permanently and it feels like you're surfing good waves um, all the time. Um, so I don't know if there's any other questions. <laughs> yeah, like we, we shared a similar background and I, I actually yeah. met Tom when I was in, in Newquay. Um, I was there for a few summers as well. Um, you were just a grom back then. Um, yeah. But yeah, we come from similar backgrounds with surfing and I, I feel the same. Like I was becoming a salty, crusty, angry, you know, bitter shortboard rider um, and foilings just completely changed everything for me. And I think a lot of people are like that. Um, you know, some, some of us, I think there's a, a smaller community that comes from the surfing. I think less less people have come across from surfing at the moment and more so from like the kite wind, yeah. wind wind surfing. I think there's a much bigger community from that. So it's interesting to hear your your perspective, Tom, as well. And we we're talking a little bit before the call about how surfers are, are reacting to having more people, you know, foiling. Uh, I had I've had a couple of experiences in uh, Costa Rica where I, where I've been. Of get being pulled out of the water or telling me to go to another beach or whatever. Like, have, how's the crowd over there, the surfers, and, and how have they taken to foiling? So, we've there's not many of us foiling here, um, and we all know each other, so we all kind of talk about this quite a lot. And there's just a general consensus just to avoid the most popular surfing beaches, um, just to not poke the bear and kind of cause an issue um we're kind of left alone really surfing foiling um 
the breaks we kind of go all the time um mainly because surfers just don't bother with those waves um if we do see anyone at those waves they tend to be people like less experienced um anyway so they're not really gonna have an issue um with a spoiling because they haven't turned into that seasoned kind of mm. salty crusty miserable surfer yet um and um quite a lot quite a lot of the time as well we're actually foiling places where there is um no lifeguard cover um for most of the year and the conditions are such that there would be no other experienced surfers in the water um so it's just us um so when you do get inevitably someone get into a bit of difficulty it's not actually such a bad thing to have boilers in the water we were talking about this the other day because if it weren't for us there'd be no water users in on these rubbish kind of knee yeah. waist high slot boils. so there is actually like you actually get an experienced people in the water on days when there would actually be no one really keeping an eye on it um so we'll argue that if they if the lifeguard service ever starts to try and shut us down <laughs> but um yeah Cool. Well, let's get into the the meat and potatoes of it. Um, so this this week we're talking about stiffness versus flex, um, or stiffness versus speed, as I like to call it. Um, I know we've all got opinions on it. Um, so I, I want to direct this at you, Tom. Where do you stand on the stiffness versus flex debate? Um, I know that you've you, you've um, expressed to me, you know, like we've sent you some some of our new gear, the Katana masks, um, and we've got our standard masks as well. Um, so, yeah, what, what do you think about the whole stiffness versus flex? Well, uh, I reserve some judgment because this is just what I feel at the moment. I'm very aware that my opinions could develop on this um, over time. So, but initially what I feel um, going between like a standard mast and a stiffer mast is at the moment, it seems like to get a stiffer mast, we're having to change the thickness and the cord a bit. Mm. So straight away when I jumped on the Katana, you can feel, you can feel like it's slower. Um, mm. And it's not just the Uni Katana, it's the same with the No Limits um, mast. It's just that just seems, with the materials we've got, the way we're having to go with it. So, like we always say, it's you can feel it's everything's a compromise. There's pros and cons to it. Um, so I could definitely feel on the stiffer masts, when you're pumping, everything feels more direct down. Um, but even if sometimes when you kind of go slightly off center with your board and you push down, like it feels completely solid. There's obviously no kind of give at all there and everything feels very kind of efficient and all your energy goes straight down into it. Um, but then when I get onto a wave, I definitely notice like there's just that bit of drag um, coming in. And at the minute with a mindset I'm in right now, my priority is being on a wave and riding i'm not so concerned with um everything being 100 percent efficient with energy transfer on a pump uh, because at the end of the day i'm only pumping to get to a wave to ride that wave as good as i can so if i lose a bit on the pump i'm not really too concerned i just want to have like feel this efficient the most slippery feel possible once i'm riding that wave um so I just want everything to be faster and I would rather lean on the side of fast as possible and compromise on a bit of um, stiffness rather than everything be really stiff and compromise on a bit of speed. So that's, that's the side I'm sitting on the fence right now. Um, I'm very open to say that might be subject to change, but at the minute, that's my opinion on it. Yeah, right. And, um, you know, you're you're known as a prone foiler. Um, so how does that um, work when you want to go do a downwind up or um, you want to pump around on a on a big hyper or something on a big high aspect wing? Um, would you still ride the the standard mast then, or do you think it's just uh, discipline specific? 
Okay, so if if I'm pumping and I'm say I'm riding knee waist high waves and my priority for that session is just to stay up for as long as possible, just pumping around. I think the katana or a stiffer mast is a hundred percent probably the go. Um because when you're pumping around, you're not it doesn't feel like you're exceeding the speed which that kind of thickness and cord is happy in. Mm. Um so that I can I completely get it. Um so I guess that would be the same for maybe downwinders as well. Um and so I get it. I get it in that regard, um, completely. But then it feels like as soon as you get onto um when you know and you get that feeling where the, you feel like the waves really starting to give you a good push and you're dropping down the face and you kind of that's when I feel it. It kind of just feels like mm -hmm. it to me, it feels like it gets a bit stuck and a bit sticky in the water. Have you have you noticed any difference with turning? Because I that's one thing I haven't really felt as much. But... I felt it a bit, like say yeah. Um, say when, see, I jumped on, I jumped on the thicker mass with no preconceived idea of it's going to be slower. Cause all I heard was all of the rage about how you need to go stiffer. That connection. Thicker, and... you know? So I jumped on it with no kind of expectation it was going to be slower and anything. And I remember the first wave I did, um, I did a carve and as I come to come back around, out of the carve i come off the back of the wave and i thought that's that's strange like that felt a bit odd and then it, it kept doing it and i realized it was slightly it drew like a slightly wider radius because that cord mm -hmm. was maybe mm -hmm. a little bit more so it's sort of um, again it's probably just an, yeah it's probably just an adjustment thing i guess in that regard but if you're looking for like for like kind of what you initially feel that's definitely there for sure yeah yeah, uh, I think it's important to um, to make sure that you're having the right gear for for the right discipline that you're trying to do, um, and not just kind of lump it all in to it needs to be as stiff as possible, or it needs to be it, it needs to be as fast as possible. Um, and and something that you said to me the other day, Tom, about the the, the you, you go to great lengths to design the most efficient foil possible, and then you have this big fat um leading edge of the mass that's slowing everything down um and just defeats the purpose of having an efficient foil if your mast is too too thick um yeah as I say, uh... yeah so you know we, we come from wave riding and that's our kind of focus and and, and you, that's that's kind of what uni is known for right is prone anything waves e even on the on the wind wing freestyle or riding waves is is what we're known for so um so yeah, I I totally agree with what you said about I I prefer the the normal mast when I'm riding waves. I definitely feel the katana that's easier to pump when I'm on a katana, but I I want to go like you as fast as possible and and turn as hard as possible. So, so yeah, Cliff, what about you? Like, where do you stand on the whole thing? I think I think Tom's pretty much hit the nail square on the head. <clears throat> it's all about um, compromise. Um, Again, Tom's not, not not one of the heaviest riders out there. Um, for me personally, you know, I don't pump. I've only just started pumping now and connecting waves and doing that kind of thing. So it's never been a priority for me. Um, I've always been about, you know, the efficiency of the foil. So I've always liked the standard mast. And climbing on the Katai now, I was like, I just feel that it's a little bit slower. It doesn't... Um, make me a better foiler as such but but that's because you know i don't i don't pump you know we've always just towed in on, on bigger waves and you can just feel the drag and so um exactly what tom said when you're riding in smaller surf and you're going slower then you don't feel the drag yeah. whereas if you're going to be towing in in big stuff then you definitely notice the drag because you're going <clears throat> quite a bit faster so yeah, if you if you're in the, on the debate of do I get a, a super stiff mast or do I stick with a standard mast, it's all about what are your objectives. If you want to connect waves, because I, I have plenty of guys that just want to pump from one wave to the next, they don't care about anything else. I want to connect as many waves as possible. Then I would say yes, definitely, definitely get a katana. If you're more interested in surfing the wave and you're going for ultimate efficiency and you're a lighter rider 
then I think twice because as Tom says, you know, that once you've tasted that, that super low drag to go back to something that, you know, you feel like you're dragging a bag of potatoes behind you. It's terrible. So yeah, exactly that. It's, it's, it's what are your priorities? What are you trying to achieve? And exactly as you said, Toby, um, using the correct gear is so important. Um, like the guys who are doing downwinding, but I mean, downwinding speed is getting faster and faster and faster yeah. now. Um, initially, downwinding was cruising at, you know, not that high speed. Um, but one of the main differences with the Katana is it doesn't have the same thickness as a lot of the um, moss that it's competing against. The Katana is only a 14.7 mil thick compared to other foils which are sitting at around 16 mils plus. Mm -hmm. So even though That's our Katana iron, is, right? yeah, yeah. So, I mean, some guys are sitting at 18 mils. So the Katana has still got very high efficiency um, because of its construction. And the taper too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we've, we've made them thicker at the base, <clears throat> taper into thinner at the, at the, the edge, at the tab edge where it goes onto the wing. Yeah, for for even more efficiency, I think a lot of other brands. I'm not even sure if many other brands do that at all. They just have a one size from the top to the bottom, straight down. No taper. Yeah. We taper the cord as well for that reason. Yeah. yeah so just just some context. Our standard mass uh, a 14 at the base, uh, where it fits onto the board, tapering down to 12 mils at the tip, um, and then the katanas are is it 12 going to 14.5. 14. No, no, 19, 19 to 14.5. Yeah. 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 So it, it, it's like ideally you'd have one of each. And when you're, when you're wave riding, you use the standard. And when you want to go and do a downwinder or pump around uh, or, or have a big high aspect <laughs> wing, you, you'd yeah. use the Katana. But we thought as a company, it's important to give riders those options. Um, and another thing we stand for is providing the options to tune your gear. And that's what we talked about on the last call, Yeah, which is really interesting is how important tuning is and how much of a game of millimeters this is. It really is like, you know, you, you, you shim one degree, it changes the whole feeling of the, you shim the tower one degree, it changes the whole feeling of the, of the board. Um, so, Yeah. Um, and also, but, also as, as, you, as you gain experience, um, this becomes more and more critical. If you have a tail stabilizer that you've got a one degree shimming, for example, <clears throat> and you change to a two degree, it's, as you say, it's, it's massive. But to an absolute newbie or someone who hasn't experimented with this, they don't know the difference. But once you start um, experimenting with shims and, and setting your foil up differently, it's exactly like we spoke the last time on, on the previous episode, like, like a skateboard changing changing the tightness of the trucks it can change the feel of the board completely and it's exactly the same with the shim you know that little piece of plastic changes the foil completely yeah so i think it's dangerous to kind of have a in foiling to have a kind of one size fits all mentality and like stiffness is better or or, or mm -hmm. whatever i guess it really depends on what you're trying to achieve and um and, and what style and what waves you're riding and things like that and the, yeah. the most the tiniest changes make a huge difference so it's really i think it, it means you need kind of more gear but then it unlocks your foiling right if if your goal is to get better then it's important to have those things in your tool bag like the different shims different masks um different wings and tails and everything yeah um and so that leads to the next question um yeah, can, can there ever be like it, too thick? Like if you're if you're wanting, say you want to go a downwind, and you go, okay, I want a stiff mast. Is is there ever a too stiff? You know, like I, I've seen a couple of people, you know, having cavitation issues and things like that. Like, um, like how 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 stiff is too stiff, or do you want a little bit of flex still, even in in those kind of conditions? I think for downwinding. <clears throat> um... I don't think it it makes that much of a difference if you have flex in the mast. Um, you'll you'll always have flex in the mast. It doesn't matter how strong you make it. You know you're always going to have flex. It just depends on how much. 
But for downwinding, it's it's all about efficiency. So if you can have a mast that sits exactly um, in that line of where it, 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 there's no point to be extremely stiff and very slow or to be <clears throat> very flexible and extremely fast. So if you can get both of those levels as high as you can, where you're still efficient and still have your stiffness, that, that's the sweet spot. That's what you're aiming after. So it's important to take into consideration what speed is the right at, um, what's it going to be cruising at. The very first hypers were made to cruise at quite slow. They're only doing 22, I think, kilometers an hour, whereas the guys now are topping out at, at close to double that. I mean, some of the speeds that the guys are doing on downwinding now is ridiculous. Um, back then, it, was, it wasn't uh, an issue. Um, but now, as the riders are getting faster and faster, the performance of the foil has, is increasing more and more so. Yeah, right. And, and until a point where, you know, like, like, so I guess my question is, it, can there ever be, can it be too thick to, to a point? Like, at what point are you starting to get cavitation issues and things like that? Um, I don't think you'll get, what you can do is you can stall the, the mast. So if you, if you drive too hard on it, <clears throat> um, you can stall it. But on downwinding, I don't think that's a problem because you don't have anything to, to push against. If you're wind winging, you can stall a mast quite easily because you can, you can twist it hard up wind and you can stall it. But downwinding, you can't turn sharp enough and drive hard enough to, to stall the mast. Um, or not that I know of, I've never seen anyone do it. Um, so again, too thick, you're just going to be going too slow. So if you come out with, let's say, an inch thick mast, yeah, it's going to be crazy stiff, but you're also going to be right at the back of the queue because you're going to be going the slowest. So yeah, it's, it's, again, it's all about that compromise of stiffness versus um, drag. You want to be as high as possible to whatever discipline you're doing. So Cliff, when you're designing a foil, is this coming into your mind, like how thick the mast is? Um, versus I've, the, I've always... The I've always yeah, I've always tried to design to the maximum performance. And I've always had, because of my style of foiling and, and what I do, um, I haven't always taken into consideration the pumping because it's not something I do. Um, whereas, you know, talking to Eric <coughs> and um, you know, talking about downwinding, if I'm cruising at a slower speed, but I'm saving my energy, or if I'm cruising at a faster speed and using my energy, you know, which one do you want to be? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, who's going to win the race? So if the race is, is not too long, the guy who's going faster is going to win. If the race is very long, the guy who's conserving his energy is going to win. And that's, that's the, 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 the sort of path Eric was going, where I was going the other way. I was going, let's go maximum speed. So again, it's about who, what are the conditions or what are we trying to achieve? Are we uh, trying to achieve a 30 kilometer downwind or are we trying to achieve a five kilometer downwind? You know what I mean? So yes, um, you can go too thick with a mask, definitely, because you'll be as slow as anything. Um, so yes, it's important to, to choose a mast that is um suited to the conditions that you're going to ride in right that's really interesting um we talk a lot about when, when we say stiffness you know we talk a lot about the mass stiffness but there's other aspects too like the the flex in the actual wing um and the, and the tail so you know how important is that when we're talking about stiffness versus flex the layup of the well, your wings. Your, your, your foil is only going to be as strong as its weakest link. So there's no point to have a crazy stiff, strong mast and your wings aren't equally as stiff. If your wings are soft and floppy and they and they flex in, then it doesn't matter how strong your mast is. So it's, it's also important that the construction of your wings is um, just as important as the construction of, of your mast, that the two fit together. If your wings, you know, really soft, then it's going to be the weakest link, and it's going to be flexing. 
and it, it even goes further the, the, the fuselage the connection between your front wing and your your fuselage is just as important um uh, you know it's, it's important to have maximum rigidity there again it, it comes down to the weakest link you know where, wherever your foil is going to be the softest um that is where your your flex and everything is going to focus on that soft point so you've got to make sure that everything is in balance super important so i've got a question um for you cliff just on that so everything's like say just using the mask for example we can it's tapered slightly so it's there's a little bit less thickness and cord at the bottom of the mast and if you kind of go further towards the end of the rig um it's like the wing tips can be don't have to be quite as strong and as you come back to the fuse it has to be a bit stronger again and then as it goes into the mat it's almost like the the load the rig has to deal with as it gets closer to the board um becomes greater um am i, am I right yes. in thinking that yeah yeah pretty that, much you can almost you can almost think of it as like a fishing rod where the base yeah. is really stiff and then goes as it goes to the tip it gets thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner yeah so then um and i'm i thought about this the other day and this might seem like quite a naive childish thought but <laughs> um so how much of the water flow around the bottom section of the mass how much does that if at all support flex um in the mass because that's obviously water's obviously quite quite viscous and it's flowing at quite a speed so does that prevent some mass flex when you're going at different speeds and or at all when you say at the base you're talking about the connection to the board no i mean where it, i mean the section of your rig which is permanently in the water or majority of time in the water like say from half mass down mm -hmm. when there's yeah. quite a substantial water flow passing over those surfaces how much does that prevent flex um if at all does it stiffen things up the water itself no no i can't see that it does no okay remember you you can shift your weight around and you can load up different parts of the foil so you can load up one side of the wing versus the other side of the wing so um yes but that is you, resistance. yes there is because uh, yeah, as i say you can shift your weight around and you can load up one side of the wing versus the other side of the wing you can you load up your tail when you're pumping you load up your front wings when you're pumping so yes it does it does affect it yeah because if you because i watch sometimes on clips of me and other people um when they sometimes go through um a, a, a hard carb you can almost see like the mast kind of it might be an optical illusion, but it almost looks like it flexes the most just at that point where it comes out of the water. It's almost, I don't know if that is a thing. No, I don't think so. No. <laughs> mm -mm. I, can't, I can't see that because the water is so viscous. Um, what you're saying is, is your mass is loading, let's say, in the middle versus loading at the bottom. No, just, I don't think so. I'm just I'm just purely thinking just water flow around the surface nah, when that supports it structurally at all. No, I don't think so. No, okay. Mm -mm. I thought it might have been a potentially no thought. <laughs> so, so when you're uh, looking for a foil um, and, and you might come up to the mast and you might give it a little twist and, and a bend, check for torsional flex and and bend uh, twist like is it is it also how do you also check for the the flex in the wing you put it up on the ground and step on it and see how much twist it does how, how do you know what is good in terms of flex in the wing versus not so with the wing is it's it doesn't um, twist half as much as a mast you don't load up a wing anywhere near as to what you load up a mast. Uh, a mast, torsionally, you can load up quite a lot. On a wing, you can't because, you know, there, there's nothing resisting it on the ends. So, so as you get more and more to the tips, um, it get, becomes less and less and less. 
So torsionally on a wing isn't anywhere near as important as torsion on a mast. Um, your flex on your wing is way more important. Um, and that's, that's why we construct the wings in the manner that we do to maximize the carbon that's been used to resist um, as much flex as possible and just the way we lay it up in the wing. So you're, so you're talking about, say, if the mast is shaped like this, how much bend it has this way. So if you're pumping, you, you don't want you don't want it to be bending like that as you're as you're, you're talking about the wing. Yeah, the wing. Yep. Yeah. So it's flexing in this direction. Yeah. Mm. So the way we lay up the carbon in the wing is to utilize as much of the carbon to stop it from flexing. Your wing tip is not going to flex in this direction anywhere near as much as what a mast would. Because mm -hmm. a mast you can load up. A wing tip you can't load up and twist it anywhere near as much as a mast. So you can load up the wing when you're pumping uh, flex wise. So that's why the, the reason why we stagger our carbon as it gets to the tips is to try and maximize the stiffness of the wing, especially in, in the center section area, um, to stop it from flexing here. Mm. What, have you, what do you have in your hands there, Cliff? Looks this. Like a six. <laughs> Is that good looking or what? Uh... <laughs> sure, there's a lot of people that would want to know where you live right now. I could have sold this thing about a hundred times over. <laughs> <laughs> They're coming soon, guys. Be patient. Very um, soon. Yeah, we, 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 couldn't, we couldn't rush this release. So you, you, you would have seen that there's some in the water. Tom's got some. Um, but yeah, these are like, we just wanted to make sure that everything's good before we go and scale it to the, to the general public. So it's coming in a couple of months. Uh, we'll, we'll release more info um, pretty soon on, on the ac actual release date. But so far we've had great feedback. They're definitely worth the wait. Yeah. Um, so does it matter much about the different carbon use? We hear a lot about uh, high mod or high modulus carbon versus um, standard. And there's different grades of carbon you can get all the way up to like military grade uh, that becomes more expensive. Um, Cliff, you are the chief technology officer and the designer for uni. You're responsible for all the layups that we do on our, on our wings. Is is there is there a certain um, a method to make it stiffer, like, and, and, and how important is high mod? Yeah, so so one of the challenges is is what um, what materials can you get hold of? Um, you can only build as good as the materials that you can get. So yeah, to be great to get you know military spec carbon but to get hold of it and to be able to um, manufacture that is is a completely different kettle of fish so we were very fortunate to have a supplier who could supply us with a very high grade carbon and one thing you must realize is when you go to high modulus carbon is yes it, it's it becomes a lot stiffer but it also becomes more fragile um, in the same sense that like um, a piece of glass, a piece of glass shatters and very high modulus carbon has the same problem. It becomes so stiff that it becomes fragile. But when you use it um, in a way where you can exploit its stiffness and make it stronger somehow else, um, you can take, for example, a piece of glass and you put plastic on either side. So that makes it a, a, a lot stronger. Um, it's the same with a high modulus mast. So by using an intermediate modulus on, on the mast and using the high modulus, um, uh, exploiting its strength on, on the outside of the mast is, is the one way that you can get away with um, using this material, um, which yeah makes a, a huge difference in, in, in its stiffness. Yeah, right. So there's, there's actually science behind the layup and, and, and mm. what carbons use where and... Mm. Yeah, it's super important to get your layup right and as I say to to maximize um, the strength of the carbon being used <clears throat> yeah very important 
and, and all these little things just go towards making the stiffest setup possible so that you're not losing yep. efficiency. Yep. Yep. Uh, all right. So next question we have here is, um, we actually get a lot of, uh, we get a lot of these questions. So I've kind of just bundled it into one question, but, um, you know, you see the different foil brands, um, they all have different, um, design fitments. You know, you see the Armstrong with the, with the mask, with the circle on the, on the end, uh, where the fuse goes through, you see the Cabrina that has kind of a, a, a twisted one like this, uh, where the mask joins the wing. Uh, we have it, we have, you know, we have our fuse built into the front wings. Axis doesn't. Um, they have you know, the mask going into the front wing. So, you know, what what was the thinking behind the unifoil design? Um, and, and what's the science behind it? Is it, you know, we get a lot of these kind of kind of questions. Is there a method to the to the way you did it? Yeah. So, so it's again, it's all about compromise. Um, it's about looking at um, obviously foils in this case and trying to see you know what is the best way of, of manufacturing this and what is the best way of of constructing it because as we've seen there, there's many ways to make foils and this is something that I learned very quickly when I started making foils um, how important it was to maximize the strength um, my first designs were a separate fuselage and a separate front wing um, but this is, this is quite tricky to do, to, to make a fuselage out of full carbon is, it's not easy. It's, it's, it's quite difficult. Um, and the reason for it is because you've got a two part mold. So when the mold closes, you can't have carbon on one side and carbon on the other side and just butt jointed immediately. It'll, it'll just split along that line. So now what you have to do is you have to have your carbon go past that joint. So now you've got to do something like a Swiss roll where your carbon is continuous and then it just gets enveloped in, in the mold. Um, if, it's a, if it's a half and a half and it's just joined together like that, it's not going to last long at all. And so my first few fuselages were that type of construction and I tried to do the Swiss roll effect and it is very difficult to do. And I soon, soon realized that doing a half and a half on a fuselage, the left and the right, now your mask goes into it. Now your mask acts like a crowbar. And that mask is the whole time trying to do this and it's trying to split these parts open. And that's when I changed from a, a left and a right to a top and a bottom like that. So when your mask went in, it was trying to, to, to break a continuous fiber, not a fiber that had been back joined or overlapped. Um, so the very first uni unis that came out, the front wing and the fuselage was all one piece. Mm. Mm -hmm. I remember those. We call them the so, <laughs> yeah, absolute nightmare to post and to oh, travel with. Shipping, mm -hmm. The shipping was just a nightmare on those <laughs> Killer. Yeah. So, uh, to, I mean, what's the best way to make a foil? If, if you had no... Um, um, money constraints or design limits or the best way to make a foil is is to make it out of one piece, piece. Yeah. It, you know it makes sense it have no joints in it it must be all one continuous piece so, so there's pros to it but there's also cons to it number one obviously to travel with the thing is going to be a nightmare number two tunability you you, you now lose the um, possibility to 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 tune the foil so if a person that weighs 60 kilograms rises the foil and a person who weighs 100 kilograms rises the foil, you need two different, you need to tune it differently because you have different wing loadings. So a foil made out of one solid uh, piece has positives, but it also has negatives. And every time you put a junction into the foil, you create a, a, um, a section where you could have a potential weak spot. So the more joints you put in your foil, the more um, areas you have for uh, weakness. So it's important to put those junctions in at the correct places. And that's where, where I think Unifoil has done really well. And, and the proof of it is because our design hasn't changed you know, since the start. Yes, we, we made the fuselage as a two-piece. 
but looking at other brands they've used a specific method um, for a year or two years and then they've stopped using that method and they've changed so you'll see anyone who's using a front wing and a fuselage that is one piece to me that is the best um, and you'll see quite a few manufacturers have changed to this method and look at what method did they use beforehand why did they stop using their method beforehand and why did they change to this method because it's the best mm. um, so if, if you if you have a foil let's say you have brand a and brand b and brand a's mast is exactly the same as brand b's mast and brand a's wing is exactly the same as brand b's wing then you need to start looking at the connections how what method have they used to join these two together so when you have your front wing as a separate piece and you have your fuselage as a separate piece you've now got a join here and what you'll find is because the fibers aren't continuous when you talk that up you'll see how weak that connection is and it doesn't matter how many bolts you put into it to try and hold the two together you're always going to find that that connection is going to be your weakest link so yeah that is why in my opinion this is still the best method of constructing a foil that can come apart so so you're talking about the the the, the, the so we've got a fuse built into the wing or half the fuse built into the wing which then yes. fits onto the mast so you're saying the brands that just have a wing and then have a fuse that fits in um where the wing where the wing meets a fuse that's a really so this, this is this this little section over here mm -hmm is one of the most stressed parts on a foil. When you're pumping, you're trying to bend this. When you're turving and carving, you're trying to twist this. So every time you, you do a carve and you load up the one side of the wing, you're now putting a, a, a twisting motion in here. So some brands, your, your fitment here has to be 100% perfect. And then you need to hold the two together. But you'll still see when under test, under loads, I can show you videos where under test when you when you twist this you'll see how you get movement here mm. and when you have movement here when you're foiling you feel that movement you can feel how, how it starts to rock in there so that kind of goes back to what you were saying before is you can have a really stiff mast and a stiff everything but then if the fitments aren't aren't nice and tight then it just defeats the purpose of having exactly yeah, exactly. So, so, so the more times that you put a joint in the foil, the more um, room for error that you have. And, it just... and that's, that's why I think Unifoil's um, design from the beginning has been, again, as I say, in my opinion, um, the best. And then does and it I... get... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Tom. No, I was just going to say just on the subject of that, um, fitment as well. I quite like the, um, after looking at other brands as well, I quite like the, um, the conical fitment on the end of the mast into the fuse. Oh, the taper. The, yeah, that taper conical, because after looking at other brands who don't have that similar fit, that, that conical seems like quite foolproof because when you, when you screw in now, that conical pulls down in and you get a really, a really tight fit there when you um screw it in and um yes looking at obviously i'm not going to mention any other brand names but i'm noticing now there's other brands sticking more and more screws in mm. that connection mm. to make up for that kind of join there and a lot of them seem to harp on about how it's all about that connection but then they're now using screws to prevent movement rather than like a carbon on carbon perfect join um, mm. So I think there's a lot to be said for that nice conical connection there. Mm. Again, that, that's that's a, that's a good point. So when you have, for example, a hole and you have a shaft that fits in that hole, let's say your your hole is ten millimeters big, and your shaft is ten millimeters big, the shaft will not go in the hole. It's an interference fit. So what you have to do is you have to make that shaft just a little bit smaller than the hole for it to fit. So if you make that, that shaft just that little bit too small, now it rattles. Mm. So obviously, I mean, we know all about tolerance <laughs> over the years of manufacturing at, at Uniform is you have to work to a tolerance. And to get that shaft to fit in that hole with a really, really tight tolerance, 
requires more input. It, it, it's, it's more cost, um, more quality control to make sure that that fits exactly in there and that pushes up the price of your foil. But the moment you take that shaft and you make it now a taper and you make this hole a taper, now you don't have as high a tolerance because as those two fit together, it locks up on the taper. Mm. So now you don't have that rattle and the harder you push it in there, the tighter it locks up. So yeah, a great, again, uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic um, junction to use in there, to, to use a taper fitment. If you use a parallel fitment, as you say, now you've got to put more and more bolts. And all that it's doing is it's just tweaking those bolts. If you've got a parallel um, um, part going into a parallel slot, from the moment that part goes in there and it touches, now you've got drag all the way until it bottoms out. And then if you have just the slightest bit of movement to get it in there, now you've got a rattle in there. So yeah, taper fitment is, is the best there. And so what about carbon's life over time? Does it get looser? Do fitments get looser? Do, do wings get more flexy over time or does it, does it hold its, um, its... Carbon has got a very, very low fatigue rate. Um, yes, when you take your, your parts apart, um, they'll become more and more seated. So they'll fit better and better and better and better together. They'll they'll fit nicer and nicer. They'll actually wear into each other. And that's that's the beauty of the uniform is even if it wears, it just gets tighter and tighter and tighter. It's not going to wear that it gets looser and looser and looser. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the beauty of the mast. Um, it just goes in just that little bit deeper. If it goes in 0.2 deeper, 0.3 deeper, 0.5 deeper, it just locks up tighter and tighter as it starts to seep and goes in um, more and more and more. Uh, aluminium fatigues much easier than carbon. Um, so yeah, a, a carbon wing, as long as it isn't taken past its transition in, in where it, it, it goes too far, it could last for many 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 years it doesn't fatigue like aluminium aluminium has got a um a lifespan and it doesn't corrode either mm. yeah it's interesting we we offer both aluminium and for the price point obviously carbon's more expensive so again we want to give people the option for the price point if they want to get onto uni they can start with the alu and then they want the premium they can go with the full carbon as well hmm. um so the next question i have here um uh, we we hear a lot there's some other brands again we won't mention any names talking about cfd analysis um and you know working with america's cup designers and things like that um so my question is um how how important is the is the technology from obviously America's Cup made foiling famous, right? Um, when they when they went over, when they went from being in the water surface to lifting the craft above the water, that was a game changer. Like, how much can we take? How much science can we take from the America's Cup versus what we do? Is it completely different? Um, is there anything that we can take from it? Or and also, I noticed those guys are going straight. They're not really turning and pumping and, and things like that. So, what uh, this is for Tom and for um, Cliff, like, you know. Well, I think I think it's you know they're both crafts that fly above water, you know. Mm. So yes, there are similarities. Um, the sections are completely different. Uh, the way the foils work is completely different. Um, so yes, there is there is some stuff that you can learn from them, but it's two it's two completely different sports. It's like saying, how do Formula One cars affect the average everyday car today? And there's nothing. You know, Formula One cars are are so far more advanced um, in the way they're working. You know, Formula One cars from 30, 40 years ago affected the cars hugely but today it's it's not anywhere near as much as what it used to be so the america's cup boats you know they they the size is different it's it's completely different we're relying on shifting our weight around um they not um 
yeah, they're not so... experiencing any. They're not experiencing any role at all as well, are they? To turn, they're purely turning on their your axis, um, yes. and no role. Yeah, I mean they, they don't shift their weight around to get the balance. They they've got um, active surfaces, so yeah, and and yeah. Okay, well, anything else you wanted to add, Tom? Um. Yeah, it's. It seems like you can make a foil that might go really efficient in a fast line, um, and that's probably where those CFDs come in. If you're just worried about going to A to B as efficiently as possible, but um, especially for the the prone foil and like surf style side of things, um, there's a lot going on, isn't there? And, and I think it does require maybe more so a human element of testing, and that's probably more valuable than um, maybe just the CFD of going in a straight line because, I mean, we're quite, like the human body on a, on a surf craft is quite a strange thing really because we're quite, we're quite asymmetric and it's kind of weird, isn't it? The, the whole foiling side, like when you come from it from yeah. surfing and you've got all that, that board in front. So you've got to be careful going through turns to keep, you know, you've got to press on the tail as you more you bank over and there just seems to be more, a lot going on that um, probably can only be kind of hashed out with a lot of um, a right, a lot of kind of foiling and having a lot of fun along the way. Hmm. Oh, it's the same as the CFD. CFD is it's just a tool. It's, it's another tool that you can use to um, eliminate the amount of prototypes that you make and it gives you valuable data, but you need to have um, a huge library of data to be able to to make judgments from your CFD analysis. Um, a lot of people think, you know, you just put this data into a computer and it's going to spit out the ultimate way to design a foil. It doesn't work like that. Um, it's, it's just a tool. It's, it's like a carpenter who has a plethora of tools and that's what CFD is. It's another tool that you can use to refine your design. Um, I learned a lot using CFD when I did the Hyper Ones. Um, how to move the vortex that comes off the top, or off, off the tip. You can move it around, and the CFD shows you that. And it's you know you can you can learn a lot from CFD. Um, but can it design you the ultimate foil? No, it's it's only as good as the person who's designing it and using that tool to refine your your design. So for those that don't know, what is CFD? What does it stand for? Um, CFD is what, my mind's gone blank now, computational fluid. Dynamics. Dynamics, something like that, yeah. Uh, so, and, and so what is it for, for those that don't know? It's computer software that uh, measures drag on the wing it, and- It simulates the, whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, it simulates, um, um, a liquid or a gas or matter going over your part and then it can establish uh, the lift uh, or the drag as you say so instead of building a model and running it in a water tank or something like that you can now allow the computer to sit and calculate it for you whereas many years ago we built quarter scale or 10 scale models and run them through water um cfd can now replicate that so but still nothing time. nothing makes up um the real thing you know actually going and having a part and making it and going and riding it so yeah you can refine and you can really tweak the part and you can learn a lot from your adjustments um, so yeah, very, very helpful. So something that Tom touched on a bit earlier, um, you know, he said it's, it, it's good for going in a straight line, but what about turning? Can, can CFD show you how the foil is going to turn? I know you put a uh, dihedral in a lot, in a lot of your designs for that easier role. Like where does that come from and, and how do you figure that out? Is it just 
uh, feedback so, from riders. So there are other programs where you can where you can draw your foil and you can run a simulation. Um, I don't have access to anything that can do um, for for hydrofoils. I've done simulations for aircraft, and that's that's where the problem is. Is that on an aircraft, um, once you run the analysis, it'll tell you if the uh, if the if the craft is stable or not. And if you have to run that same analysis with a hydrofoil, it tells you that it's unstable because it's designed for aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, so CFD, I, I'm not that advanced with it that I could tell you what it's going to tell you in the difference in turning. Mm -hmm. that, that to me, I, I'd rather have a rider ride it and you know, give me feedback. Do you think it, 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 the technology ever will get to a stage where it can tell you that stuff? Um, if there's enough demand for foils, uh, you know, you, I think yes. I think it, it is possible if you change your parameters. I think I think yes, it's it's possible to to write software that can do that. Um, it's it's all just about changing the algorithms that are going to tell you. So you're going to tell the computer this shape is stable and then this shape is unstable so then it will calculate you know if something's in between that that it'll, it'll tell you if it's stable or not so it's just about changing the algorithms that define you know if it's uh, going to be a craft that is unstable or not or but in terms of um, drag and lift i mean that we can do now already but I, yeah for turning for turning, I'm not sure. I have a personal question. Um, so because foiling, like the way we do it is so subjective and people like different things, it's, there's no one size fits all. Whereas say if you're in America's cup, you're trying to get from point A to point B in as fast a time as possible. Like, you know, there's pumping involved, there's turning. Um, like, it, it, wouldn't it always like how how are you going to measure like like something that's so subjective? You know, is there always going to be that subjectiveness in it? Um, I don't know. It's uh, I don't think you can. Or why doesn't everybody write the exact same board as Kelly Slater does? You know, just because he rides that board doesn't mean it's the best board you know i might not like it because of xyz and so and so might like it because of xyz i've had two riders ride the exact same pool and the one says to the other one it just needs a little bit more back foot pressure and the other one goes you mean front foot pressure so yeah it's different styles is going to um trump over uh, different foil designs you know, I've written foils that I thought are terrible and other people have gone, oh, it's really nice. So personal opinion is, is always going to be there, you know? Yeah. Uh, and if you, have, if you have two people in a race um, and the one person beats the other one, it doesn't mean that his foil's better. Maybe he's just better, uh, a better waterman and that he has better um, abilities. It's an interesting one that as well, actually, because in the surf kind of, culture um uh like a it seems like it's definitely down to the surfer more with the equipment um like a really good surfer can literally surf anything amazingly well um and a really bad or an average to poor surfer you can give them the best board in the world and it's not exactly. gonna make any difference so with, so with foiled i'm wondering is it the exact same or is it a little bit more down to equipment than what it is with surfing? I think it's exactly the same. Yeah. Listen, you can give Kyle Lenny a snowplow and he'll fall that thing yeah. like, you know what I mean? It's, so ability is is huge. Um, equipment, I mean, don't get me wrong, you know, using the wrong equipment is, is exactly the same thing, but it's, yeah. That's, that's what I feel. Definitely so it's seems... mainly just that... Sorry, James. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, it definitely seems like with, with the gear will open up more possibilities for you or make things easier to achieve. 
but yeah, it's down to the, the skill and talent, isn't it? Hmm. I think there's there's a balance between the two. Exactly as you said, Tom. You can give a, an absolute cook the best world there is. Doesn't mean he's going to ride it. It's the same with anything in life, really. Is cars, motorbikes, whatever. Um, there's a balance of if you have someone who has got terrible gear, even though he's got the skills, if his gear is really terrible, he's, he's not he's going to be able to ride it, but he may not um, be able to ride to his full potential. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you have someone who is um, unskilled and he has a very good foil, which is suited for beginners, it's going to help him to, to learn to foil um, a heck of a lot easier than giving someone an advanced foil. You know, just because the foil is advanced doesn't mean a beginner is going to learn quicker. If anything, it'll be a hindrance. Yeah, just to throw a slightly contrasting opinion on it um i noticed like with me personally when i swap between surfboards which aren't so good as opposed to a really good surfboard um i don't notice i can still surf the more to kind of a relatively kind of you know high-ish level when i go between different foils i think the difference is stark mm. like i i think the equipment in foiling um, maybe just in the spectrum I'm kind of talking about, maybe not quite so broad. It seems to make so much more difference than than surfing. Like I, if you put me on some other foils, um, I know there's an adjustment period, um, but the the difference in in the efficiency, how it pumps, how it turns. I know everything's a compromise, but it seems like some foils. There's no, I can't, I can't, I'm struggling to find the pros. Um, and then mm. obviously some of the uni stuff. Um, it, it just seems some, in some ways, I think there is, there is like a massive difference with, um, with equipment in foiling. That it feels like there is quite a, a gap um, there with how much enjoyment and fun you can have. Like the, the better the equipment, I think it just improves your fun so much more. Whereas a surfboard, to be honest, a like for like relatively similar stuff, but I still feel like I can go out and surf all right. I have a question for you, Tom. Um, you come from the surfing background. Uh, no doubt you've worked with shapers before, given feedback and things like that. And now you're um, giving feedback to Cliff and, you know, it's becoming like that kind of relationship, the, the surfer shaper relationship. Um and how, how's that experience been for you, um, you know, working with Cliff and giving feedback and everything like that versus the surfing side? Oh, it's kind of a dream, really, because um, it it's strange with foiling because for some, I don't know if you've got the same perception of it as well. It seems like um, it's been going on for ages and really it's only like been going on like a few years. Um mm. So because we're kind of in this at such a an early stage, it kind of makes it even more exciting. Whereas the surfing is like quite a well trodden path. Um, it's kind of already been uh, figured out. Um, so with foiling, it's almost like you you never know whether you're about to stumble across something like you've never felt. Or so it's just like um, incredibly exciting. And then obviously to work with Cliff is absolutely amazing and um it just seems unreal really because when I was um looking at getting into foiling and I was seeing uni and Adam and Cliff um I, I wouldn't have dreamt like right now I would actually have any opportunity at all to kind of um even be talking to you guys let alone kind of involved um in the process so yeah it's just um incredibly exciting um time to be involved in this and how does it how does it differ like when you're giving feedback um to cliff you know what are the kind of things that you're telling him um so it's it, it's tricky because we was kind of like just things like pumping it's like do we know the exact parameters that um make a foil pump better um like if you keep some kind of 
features of it the same and just changing one thing what what makes it kind of pump better and there's still like it feels like there's still quite a few unknown kind of things where with surfboards it's kind of very already very um dialed in and kind of set it seems like foiling is is so much more complex um what's going on with it because because you've got so many variables you've got so many more variables right because then you've got the board the swing weight that you know that like is is the mass shimmed is it not you know what what See, when you look at, using? so almost like a surfboard in comparing it to like a foil it, a surfboard's almost like quite a crude instrument like you're kind of just sliding along the water surface and you're kind of using drag to kind of turn mm. whereas like a foil is just like so much more complexity to features and you know like degrees of change of like millimeters or even less has a massive difference i mean yeah there'll be some pro level top surfers who might feel a mill on a surfboard but it seems like the tolerances are so much more accurate and finer on the foiling yeah so like sorry go ahead no i was just going to say exactly what, what tom's saying now you know just going back to the cfd um chat um cfd will give you information that you need to be able to decipher as to how's it going to affect your part and, and just to quickly just give you an example this is our flay tail so when we brought this out the original ones had quite a steeper um tip you know the the, the angle was quite a bit steeper and you now chatting to the riders this is an incredibly difficult foil um, tail to pump. And it's because of span wise flow, because your, your fluid is traveling down the edge. So when you're trying to pump, because remember your tail stabilizer is pushing down. So now when you're trying to pump, you're trying to create lift off, a sub, off, off an object that's pushing downwards. So by taking this tip upwards, you're making it harder to pump. So if you actually take this tip a little bit downwards, it now catches the water and it makes it easier to pump. So if you put that into a CFD, it wouldn't tell you that. It wouldn't tell you this and this foil is going to be easier to pump than this foil. It'll, it'll give you information. And if you can decipher that information and, and understand this information that it's giving me that this is going to be easier to pump, this is going to be harder to pump, then you can make you know, it becomes effective. But for me to give this to a rider and to give him another one and go ride it and tell me, you know, which is better, is also just as effective. That's why I say it's so important to have a rider who is in tune with his gear and who can feel these differences. I just wanted to edit that. Yeah, so it sounds like the you know, the feedback from real riders is is still it's, number it's one. It's just as important. It's mm -hmm. just as important. Um, to me, it's because I have a reasonably good understanding of, of, of foils and the different shapes and the different ways that they work. Um, you know, to have good rider feedback is number one. Okay, I've got a final question for for you guys. Um, getting around the top of the hour now. Uh, so, what what innings? Say if we're if we're in a baseball game, there's nine innings. Um, nine being kind of probably where surf surfboards are now, like you know, after 50 years of, of development, even more, 60, 70 years of development, where do you think we are in foiling and in terms of the innings? And how much more do we have to go? Foil design. Is that is that for me? <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one. I think uh, foiling's here to stay, eh? It's here, it's here to stay without a doubt. Um once you've ridden a foil board and you've tasted that efficiency, it's 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 drugs, isn't it? <laughs> it's super addictive. It's once you've tasted that efficiency and that smoothness and that flying, if it's something that appeals to you, it's just it's it's incredible. And it's it's, it's exactly the same as surfing back in the day. You know, when the when the guys started surfing, they're like, "This is incredible," and I think foiling is is exactly the same thing. Will it um, ever stop being developed? Or surfboards stop being developed? No. We will always be um, 
tuning and changing and as we get new materials to work with we'll always be be pushing that and yeah falling here to stay without a doubt in terms of where you think we are in terms of like foil design are we kind of still in the very early stages or do you think we're starting to figure out in general you know like what works and and, and or do we still have a long way to go with that no i think in in terms of um standard foils that we have now yeah i don't think you're going to see massive massive changes from the um, front lifting wing rear stabilizer i don't think you're going to see a massive change in that um, i do have however feel that as i've said before we're going to at some point be doing um, a digital type foil with moving surfaces i think that that is the next thing in in foiling personally Right, Would you have a little? Do you reckon there'd be like a little? You'd have a little remote somewhere, or it would just sense the speed you're traveling at. Oh, you could have both. You could have a little remote that you could change your whatever. You could have an app on your watch. You can find dial in your your your, your tail stabilizer. Uh, conditions are really rough. Whatever you want a bigger stabilizer, you just dial it in. Yeah. I really for some reason that... for, for some reason conceptually. I don't like I don't like the sound of it because <laughs> it's like um <laughs> like to to me like the um like an autopilot almost like, it's, it's, why I like, it's why I like prone foiling because it's like down to the user to adjust to the environment and that's almost more than fifty percent of the enjoyment is responding to the um what's going on around you so as soon as like I feel like there's any kind of mechanized part to it. I feel like it takes away so much from the, I don't know what it is. I just, I just, for some reason, I mean, I'm saying this now about trying, them, but <laughs> I don't know. Listen, you know how many surfers have told me that? Oh, but you're not surfing anymore. And I'm like, well, I think, I think you, you're more connected to the wave than you can be on a surfboard. You, you, you know, you're in that wave. You, you, you're part of that wave. You, you, you feel the energy of that wave. Mm. That's so. Yeah, I think let's make one and try it. <laughs> well, I'm not saying I won't try it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could see it be a fantastic tool for learning to foil. And, and getting See, that's, that's the thing is, is you, you, you can dial in the amount of roll sensitivity there is on the foil. You could make it tighter, looser. You could, yeah, I think the, the possibilities are endless. Yeah, so I guess it depends whether it responds to kind of like instantaneously to what's going on. Or you can kind of, it just gives you that adjustability option. Like as the session goes on, you can maybe just adjust something on your watch, like you say. And then you can ride it like that. But almost, mm -hmm. I cut that, that almost kind of I can kind of see as being um, good, but something that adjusts to the environment for you, so it almost takes out the user input, is something sure. that I, I feel a bit strange about. You mean something like an efoil? Well, yeah, if you take it, I see the efoils on that full end of the spectrum, and then you've got just like our normal ones, and then what you're describing potentially sits somewhere in between. Um, yeah, and I, yeah, I, I, yeah. It's almost like I just like the fact that it's so. That's almost half the appeal is the fact that it's so hard to kind of do, and you've got to adjust. To that keeps that kind of addictive nature to a some sense, doesn't it? Because if it's it's almost like um, with surfing, why surfing is so addictive is it? It it never really feels like it gives it you, um. Mm. So it keeps you like always wanting to get better, um because it's so hard to kind of master. It's almost something you can't master. And it's almost the same with foiling. It's it's what I was worried about foiling wouldn't be, but it, it is. It's that thing that you can never master. There's infinite lines you can draw on the wave and yeah. you never feel like you've done it right. Um, there's always room for improvement. So that's what I kind of like about something that's not adjustable because it kind of forces you to um, mm. make it work in the situation. True. So I've got a final question for you, Tom. I promise this is the last one. Um, so we talked about <laughs> where where we think we are in foil design. Where do you think we are with actually foil uh, riding in terms of the innings? Like, 
you think it, like it's it's just going to be a forever evolving thing? I think it's going to be driven a lot by what riders are doing foiling for. Because um, I'm looking at why I got into foil initially. Initially, the first reason was I just wanted that the hyper wing that Clifford designed because I thought, oh, this would be great on the flat days. I'll just be able to pump around in circles and just ride like barely any waves. So then when the waves aren't good for actual surfing, I'm just going to pump that wing around and just keep myself fit. And then as the more I foiled, the more it's kind of crept away from just wanting to be pumping around in bad waves. So now I've started riding it in slightly better waves and I'm like, wow, this is like, feels even better. Um, but then, so how far is it going to creep into the surfing kind of um, domain of what guys are doing on shortboards? Does it get to a point where that a, a certain wave shape where you, a surf, you're still going to go back to a surfboard because it deals with that style of thing a lot better than a foil? Um, it's like hard to know what, what our desires are going to be to do because... At the minute, we're all quite happy just kind of carving around and doing loops on like kind of fatter fake waves, which obviously, as soon as you get that kind of steeper section and like a lip row and on a shortboard where you're kind of going up side down into that section, like blowing the tail out the back and airs, that looks way more dynamic. But at the minute, we're so happy just riding fatter waves, carving around. Uh, we're not really pushing it in those style of, you know, like classic kind of reef break, mentor a style wave. You wouldn't. It seems like you wouldn't want to put a foil in that right now. And and it's like, why would you? So you can have so much fun in the fat stuff. So it's almost like we're content in kind of what we're doing now um, and don't feel the need to. But that being said, you can feel yourself gradually wanting to test it, you know, in slightly better um, waves. And, and yeah. then you think, are we going to want to draw the same lines as a surfboard? Are we going to want to mimic what a surfboard does on a wave? Is that doing foiling an injustice to try and just make it look like shortboarding? There's so many well, questions. Just ride there, a like, well, what's that? Yeah, ride a surfboard. Yeah, because mm. is a surfboard still going to do? Is is a surfboard always going to deal with that shapey, curved, overpowered situation? Because that you almost need inefficiency in those situations, don't you, to kind of deal with the speed and still be able to turn. And it seems like conceptually a foil. It's always going to be too efficient for a wave that's kind of really drawing off the bottom. So obviously there's guys doing it, isn't there? Because that Matea draw out was towing into Chopu and that. But in that situation, you can clearly see a surfboard is far better and king in that in that circumstance to a foil. Um, mm -hmm. So it's almost like a, such an amazing feat. He's done that. And I really enjoy watching that. But you can, and he would admit himself, a surfboard's way better in that situation. Um, but I can kind of feel myself now wanting to do those more kind of top to bottom style foiling and wanting to kind of push into slightly better waves. But I don't know. I don't know where the line is, where you're going to suddenly think, well, this is maybe getting a bit silly. You should just jump on the shortboard. Um, but I think we're definitely going to be going more top to bottom and doing more radical stuff in slightly better waves. And, um, and it's incredibly fun to do that on a foil. Mm. Yeah, I was the same as you, Tom. I started on the high aspect, pumping around, and then once the Vipers came out, it completely changed the game for me. It it turned from um, something that I did in my spare time um, to stay fit and have fun to like a complete obsession once I got my hand on a Viper 130 and it started to feel like shortboarding and now it keeps me awake at night thinking of the lines that I draw on a wave. Um and I, I've I've been going to certain places, you know, Cabo in Mexico with really long right hand point breaks and riding actual proper point break waves on a foil. And like I, I just get more and more um excited every 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 session because it's 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 like a big canvas now that you can you can get around sections and you're not stuck in that little pocket. Like in, in a surfboard, you're stuck in the little pocket, whereas yeah. now you can actually outrun it, go way down, go way up. And uh, I can relate to what you're saying about going more top to bottom and 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 thinking about doing big big tail hucks and 
you know, watching guys like you and Adam, um, the way you guys approach a wave and Dylan, like, has been really inspiring to me. And I think we still, there's still a long way we can go. And I'm excited to see you guys and some of the kids coming through of, you know, what the next generation does on, on those kind of waves. Mm -hmm. But I, I think in terms of prone foiling, that's the next evolution is going in more steeper waves and going more top to bottom, which is yeah, what... I think, I think, I think there's still quite, I think there's still probably quite a way um, things are going to progress in that kind of shoulder high, head high wave, which isn't too hollow. I think there is still quite a bit more that's going to be done. They're just like tighter tighter lines and more aggressive um because the more you kind of push it a little bit harder and you kind of people learn to trust how the foil is going to react in those situations the more you'll kind of feel confident about going a little bit harder or into a little bit of a steeper section and i don't think we've hit that just yet of like pushing it to the complete max um but then obviously there's going to be a point where you think no this wave is just not suitable um mm. potentially i'm sure there's going to be some crazy people going absolutely ham in um hollow waves on foils though yeah that's where i draw the line when it starts to get hollow I'm, I'm i'm grabbing the short board still <laughs> just, it just feels like the risk reward is just not worth it eventually doesn't yeah. it yeah all right yeah that's all we got so thanks, fellas. I think that was a great chat, uh, as usual. Thanks for your input, Tom. It's great to have you on. We'll, we'll try and get no you worries. back on another another thanks time as well. Me. Yeah, thanks, no worries. You guys. We'll sign off. Cool. See you in the next episode. So the next next episode we have is tail design, um, which will be out in a couple of weeks. So that's going to be an exciting one as well. Right, see you later. later. Cheers, guys. See you later.